What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Friday's edition of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I am your host, James Murphy, and thank you so much for joining me on this beautiful, absolutely gorgeous afternoon here we're having in New England. It's incredible to finally have what it feels like consistent spring weather. It's like consistently upper 50s, lower 60s. We're starting to creep into the 70s. I think tomorrow it's going to be in the 70s. Uh, Tomorrow it's going to be 72. So spring, it feels like, is officially here. Yes, we still have to be on the lookout for potential cold weather, but it certainly feels good to finally have some shorts weather, right? And like a t-shirt and not have to bundle up in sweats and jackets and all that good stuff. But anyways... Hope you had a wonderful week and you're going to have a wonderful weekend. Hopefully, maybe this podcast will help you achieve that, which is hopefully something that could happen. But nonetheless, we have a jammed, packed episode to go over. We have the Bruins, the Celtics, the Red Sox, and the Patriots to all talk about. It is just full of content in this episode. We have so much to discuss. The Bruins winning, beating the Capitals. The Celtics beating the Knicks. The Red Sox sweeping the Rays and winning their first game against the Orioles. And obviously the Patriots aren't playing, but there is a little bit of news about the Patriots in terms of a couple of their players. So we're just going to have to wait until we get there. But first, let's just dive right into it. Let's just talk about the Boston Bruins who beat the Capitals, like I said, 4-2 to two in regulation. Absolutely awesome win by the Bruins incredible game and oh on top of that that was in Washington it wasn't a home game it was in Washington in their home stadium or in the Capitals home stadium I should say absolutely great team went all the way around four different Bruins scored in this game four goals four different goal scores we have Brad Marchand Craig Smith Anton Blitta and Jeremy Lozon all scoring a goal in this game against the Capitals but I don't even think that's the headline of this episode or I should say of that game excuse me I don't even think that's the headline of that game is having four score uh four goals and four goal scores uh Jeremy Swayman he got his second straight start in net in Washington against the Capitals, who is a dynamite of a team. And he gets the dub. He gives up two goals yet again, which is totally fine. And he stopped 31 shots on 33 attempts, looking absolutely phenomenal in net. He looked tighter, he looked more confident, and he definitely looked more like a wall, like what you want from a goaltender. And he's so young. He's like 22 or whatever it is. Wow. I mean, if we ever needed a team win from the Bruins at any point this year we got it we absolutely got it from the team I mean you you checked all the boxes team scoring check goaltending check defense or team defense check um winning on the road check beating a team that is a cup contender check beating a team that's better than you currently check Every box was checked. I just feel like every time that the Capitals tried to come back, tried to answer whatever it may be, the Bruins absolutely sniffed it out and just kept the um, the Capitals at bay. Holy smokes. I, I'm so excited about the Bruins because this is the exact kind of win that we needed from the team. The exact kind of win that we needed from this team. And quite frankly, the standings don't change much because the Penguins also uh, won as well. So both of those teams are winning. But when you restrict a team ahead of you from getting points, that's a dub. That's a win on top of your win. So exactly what does this mean for the Bruins? Well, they squeak a little closer back towards the top. And it doesn't help that both the Penguins and the Islanders won. But you are now at 48 points. Penguins are sitting at 42. Capitals 54 I'm sorry, not 42. The Penguins at 52. Excuse me. Capitals at 54. Islanders at 56. You still have a mountain to climb. But imagine if you lost this game. Because now the Flyers are at 42. So you have six points. Three wins that separate you and the Flyers. And you play two more games than the Flyers. And you're still three games back behind um, in terms of games played. The Penguins, Capitals, and Islanders who have all played 40 games. And you're sitting at 30. Seven. Can you tell my level of excitement for this team? Because it finally feels like the Bruins 
I said that so weird. I was like, Bruins. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm just like slurring my words here, but it feels like the Bruins are finally starting to get together. So again, let me go back to my point. What does this win mean for the Bruins? It shows you that they can compete and win with the best of their division, home or away. We've seen the Bruins win and lose um, both home against the Islanders, Capitals, Penguins. You can even throw the Flyers in there if you want. But we haven't really seen them be able to win or at least win with confidence. And we saw that last night. And against the Capitals, who, quite frankly, although they're in second, I still think are the favorites in the Eastern Division. I just don't know if the Islanders have exactly the firepower and what it takes to overthrow the Capitals in a best-of-seven series, or even the Penguins for that matter. If they were to play the Bruins in a best of seven, then you know that's an argument and a conversation to have. But holy smokes. Holy smokes. This win was massive. And I still have more points to go over in terms of what this win means for the Bruins. Let me just fix my mic real quick. Here we go. Um, this is a great morality boost for the team. This is because we were all having our doubts against the Bruins. I mean, they were, you know, they were struggling to beat. The Flyers and the Devils and the Sabres. But then they go out here. They, you know, they went to Pittsburgh, they won. They went to Philadelphia and won. They went to Washington and won. This is exciting stuff. This really is. This is such a huge morality booster for the team. I mean, a team that has all the tools to win a cup. The Bruins do. I mean, they're missing some tools in their toolbox. But for the most part, they have everything they need. They got a Phillips head. They got a flat head. They got a hammer. They got a mallet. They got a, a screwdriver. They got a, uh, oh, I already said screwdriver. I meant drill. They got a uh, impact driver. They got a saw. They got a tape measure. They're just, you know, kind of missing a few tools, right? And maybe a couple tools are needing to be fixed. And I think those fixing is just upgrades. I really do. If they can upgrade then this team is really going to take off, let me tell you. Anyways, ah, I got to keep going. I keep getting sidetracked. Uh, also, what this win means is a great morality and confidence booster, not only for the team, like I mentioned, but for Swayman as well, because we could and we will see more of him this year. I would Tuka Rask down, and I'm not sold on Dan Vladar. I mean, he's nice. He's played a couple of nice games this year. But, I mean, Jeremy Swayman is looking like he is the guy. I mean, it's only been two games. And he's given up two goals in both. It'd be nice to see if he can kind of limit maybe one, maybe get a shutout. But in his two games so far uh, against the Flyers and the Capitals, which are two crucial games, he didn't he didn't shit himself. He didn't dribble down his leg and he didn't make a puddle. Like we've seen Tuka Rask do when we've had to go to Montreal and play the Canadians or go up into Toronto and play the, the Maple Leafs. No, Swayman went to Philadelphia, went to Washington and buckled down now i don't know if he'll get the start tomorrow saturday when the bruins go back to philadelphia to play the flyers we'll have to see who's in net then but ultimately i think we're going to see a lot more jeremy swayman in net and we should be absolutely excited about that because both yaroslav halak and tuka rask contracts are up at the end of the season now tuka makes a lot of money and do we really want to pay tuka that kind of money to be a goalie we know who he is when he is on and tuned in, he is a top five goalie in this league. Maybe even a top three when he's zoned in. Now, regular and generally speaking, is he a top three, top five goalie? I'd like to think more often than not, yes. But he's so unpredictable, though. I mean, like I said, you can go to Montreal and he's going to dribble down himself and, you know, absolutely vomit all over the ice. Or when we're in Toronto, he could absolutely, you know, throw a dumper in his pants and suck. But if we, if we can reinvest that money into other positional needs that we have and use Swayman, maybe bring back Halak on a, on a cheaper deal and have Swayman and Halak be our two goalies next season. And like I said, reinvest that money that we would have spent on Tuka on other positional needs. I think the Bruins next year could look a lot better because we just have to wait and see what they do with the trade deadline to see who they bring in and you know what kind of contracts they're going to be taking you know, hopefully come the trade deadline on Monday. But this is definitely a possibility, especially if Swayman keeps playing better. Now, if he was terrible on both games or either of the games, 
different conversation we're having because we wouldn't be thinking so highly of him and kind of fantasizing him about being the goalie next year. All in all, nonetheless, absolutely great win from the team. Hopefully they can keep that momentum going forward as they play the Philadelphia Flyers tomorrow at 2 o'clock in Philadelphia. And then right again the next day on Sunday, they play against the Washington Capitals in Boston. And like I said at the beginning of the seven-game stretch, 5-1-1. One, and one. Right now they're 3-1-1. One, and one. So hopefully, hopefully the Bruins can get these two wins in their next two games going into the trade deadline and really, really look like a contender for not just the Eastern Division, but for the NHL period. Moving over to the Celtics, but before I talk about the Celtics, I do want to just mention, to, and I just want to thank everyone who has uh, clicked on my Amazon affiliate link. That really means a lot to me. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, the links will be down in the description below. I've tweeted it out. I've you know posted it on Facebook numerous times, my Amazon affiliate links. You don't have to buy anything that I have linked to. It's just once you click that link, anything that you were to buy within 24 hours of clicking that link, I will get a small percentage, which is no extra charge to you. That is just a gift from Amazon for basically handing them a customer, even though we're all pretty much loyal Amazon customers. But it's just like a small little thanks to me from them after you purchase something. So please definitely consider uh, clicking those links down in the description below. Or if you find them on social media, like I said, you don't have to buy anything that's linked to it if you don't want to. I strongly recommend you do if you need some studio equipment and gear. Everything that I have in my studio is linked down below. But like I said, all you have to do is just click on the link. It'll bring you to Amazon and whatever you buy within 24 hours of clicking that link. Like I said, I will get a small percentage uh, coming back to me, which is no extra charge to you. So again, thank you everyone who has clicked and bought something with my link. Thank you so much. And I'm definitely looking forward to it more down the road. So like I said, moving over to the Boston Celtics. They too had a nice win. and They actually had a crucial, crucial win against the New York Knicks. I never thought I would ever say that for a long, long, long time. A crucial win against the Knicks. <laughs> Woo, we beat the Knicks, which is something we should be able to do night in and night out. But here we are. The Celtics beat the Knicks 101-99 on Wednesday night. That uh, jumps them to the seventh seat in the Eastern, uh, Eastern Conference. Uh, Jalen Brown had a nice game, dropping 32 points and 10, and grabbing 10 rebounds. Love to see that. Uh, I would love to see more Jalen Brown. I mean, Jason Tatum tries to take over games, and he absolutely could. I mean, all due respect, Tatum had 25 points, 5 assists, and 10 rebounds himself. So don't get me wrong. This wasn't just a Jalen Brown show. This is a you know, you know, Tatum and Brown show. I just want to see Jalen Brown, you know, have more confidence in being able to take over the games if he needs to when Tatum can't. I have no problem with Jalen Brown being the goal scorer, uh, goal scorer, the uh, the leading scorer for the Bru- uh, Oh my, see what? See, see, I do that all the time. I was just talking about the Bruins. Now I'm talking about the Celtics, and I go Jalen Brown, goal scorer, Bruins. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm not even gonna edit that out. I'm not even gonna edit it out. Anyways. I would love to see Jalen Brown be more confident and more aggressive being a a basket go-getter like you, like you see Tatum and like everyone else in the league be doing. So definitely seeing Jalen Brown taking that kind of uh, jump. It's been a nice, nice surprise this year. And we saw a little bit of it last year, especially in the playoffs um, after the NBA season kind of kicked back up. Uh, let's see, no, other notables. Uh, Time Lords, 6 points, 10 boards in 25 minutes. Marcus Smart, 17 points, 9 assists, 4 rebounds in 36 minutes. Um, ooh, yes, Romeo Langford. I did want to talk about Romeo Langford, who got 6 points, 6 rebounds, and 25 assists. Uh, so, Romeo Langford is starting to look like the player that we drafted in the first round last year. Uh, although, like I mentioned, he only got 6 points. But a small contribution is nice with him, because he still has a lot of upside. We still don't exactly know what kind of player Romeo Langford is going to be. Everyone was kind of thinking that he's going to be a bust because he was injured all the time. He wasn't really scoring. And we really haven't been able to see him healthy. He's been dealing with a lot of injuries. Lower body, upper body, head, whatever it may be. He's finally healthy and he's back on the court. 
it's good to see that because he does have a lot of upside and he was a first round talent and a first round draft pick last year. He could significantly help us. Now, I don't think he's going to, you know, put us over the top and put us in the, you know, the 76ers or the Nets or the Bucks category. Oh, God, no. But he can still be a nice addition for this team. He can be someone that you can have come off the bench, get a couple points, kind of ignite a little run maybe if the starters were kind of drying out. I really like Romeo Langford. I, I like the pick from last year, and I really think he has a lot of potential to be kind of that bench scorer that we kind of so desperately need. But moving over to someone who I'm kind of disappointed with in last night's game, and just generally speaking, is Grant Williams. The dude scored zero points, had one assist, and three rebounds in 25 minutes. I'm going to put chapstick on, but just let that simmer in your mind for a second. Zero points, one assist, and three rebounds in 25 minutes. All right, chapstick cap is on, chapstick applied. But guys, what is he doing out there? Now, last year when you know he was a rookie playing, I liked him. I felt like he was a good defender, good rebounder, has a big body, can kind of move people around both offensively and defensively. But b- besides defense, what is his purpose out there? Now, you can't put... Uh, I mean, I guess you can put a statistic on defense. I mean, you've seen Marcus Smart, Pat Beverly, Giannis, LeBron, whatever. And, you know, they play tremendous defense. But they also score points. I mean, Pat Beverly, Marcus Smart, maybe not so much, even though Marcus Smart thinks he's a scorer. But generally, defenders don't get a lot of points. So I understand that aspect of it. And this game was a very tight game all throughout. So I understand that Grant Williams needing to get 25 minutes. <clears throat> But I just want to see more, either more of him in terms of shooting and trying to score, getting to the free throw line and getting some free throws, or just sit the dude down. Just sit him down. Play the Time Lord more. Play Tristan Thompson more for all I care. I mean, if you're getting zero points in 25 minutes, I'd be okay if you're getting zero points in like 15 minutes. I'd be okay with that. Ugh, I, I don't know. It could just be one game. I could just be overthinking it, which is totally fine. But, like, if he's not contributing defense, if he's not contributing to the defensive side of the ball, there's no reason, no need for him to be getting 25 minutes. I think we all can agree about that. And I know a lot of Celtics fans out there, maybe you, maybe not you, don't even want him on the damn team anymore. <laughs> A lot of people are just kind of sick of him. He's like a Jared Sellinger 2.0 because he's, you know, you know, kind of a, a thicker guy who plays, you know, looks like he plays tough, but ultimately plays soft, sits outside the three-point arc and just hucks him. Sellinger and, Bo- and Grant Williams both do that. Well, I guess Sellinger did do that, and Williams does do that now. I still think there's a lot of upside with Grant Williams. I really do. He could be a pivotal piece because he's versatile, you know, being a big man. But like I said, 25 minutes and no points, three rebounds and one assist. I mean, I could care less about the assist from a big man, but three rebounds in 25 minutes? Like, what are you doing? Like, if you're defending and you're a big man getting all these minutes, you got to be coming down with some rebounds. I mean, Tristan Thompson got eight rebounds in 22 minutes. Langford got six rebounds in the same 25 minutes that Williams got. And Robert Robert Williams, Time Lord, got 10 rebounds in the same 25 minutes that Grant Williams got. So Grant Williams needs to kind of step up his game a little bit. Otherwise, he's going to lose all of the Celtics fan base because I know for a fact that he's already lost some of it. It's true. He's lost some of the Celtics fan base. I I know a bunch of people out there. You're messaging me. You're tweeting at me about Grant Williams wanting him gone. I get that. I'm listening. I'm hearing you. But, I mean, who are we going to replace him with? Taco Fall? Are we really going to replace him with Taco Fall? No. No, no, no. But I do agree. I do agree that that backup big man could be kind of adjusted. I mean, we have Tristan Thompson for... I think next year as well. Yeah, he's had a two-year contract, so we'll have Tristan Thompson next year. But if I'm going to be completely honest with you, I'd rather just have Ennis Cantor 
fill in that same role because at least I know what Cantor is. He's going to get you almost a double digit rebounds and he's going to probably get you almost double digit points because he gets the offensive rebounds and he puts it right back up. But you traded him in the off season back to Portland. I, I just like in 25 minutes, Ennis Cantor could have done that and more. Now, obviously, Grant Williams and Ennis Cantor are two different kind of big men. Ennis Cantor is more of a rim protector um, who can kind of guard the post. Grant Williams can guard the post, but he's no rim protector. You know, he's more versatile than Ennis Cantor because Ennis Cantor is a solid five, where Grant Williams can kind of be your four, or your five, depending on the matchup, maybe a three, which you probably don't want to see. So, just one game. But, you know, I've definitely seen games like this from him before. And it's just something to keep note of. Something to keep your eye about. But, you know, to leave the Celtics off on a, on a better note before I switch over to the Red Sox, it's good to see Romeo Langford back on the court playing somewhat consistently. Hopefully we can see a lot more from him in, this, uh, in the shortcoming. But at the end of the day, the Celtics beat the Knicks 101-99. Absolutely massive win. And now the Celtics are only one game out from the four seed. But... The Miami Heat, Atlanta Hawks, and the Charlotte Hornets are all in front of them, taking up the four, five, six spots. So, one win from the Celtics and three or one losses from all three of those teams. Celtics are in that four spot, baby. We're going to be there. You just have to play Celtics basketball. That's all you got to do. Beat the teams you should be able to beat. And speaking of which, the Celtics, let me exit out of this. Let me go back to the schedule. Celtics got the Timberwolves today at 7.30. Celtics will be at home playing against the Timberwolves to end that massive homestand. Got to win this game. Absolutely have to win this game. You lose to the 76ers and you beat the Knicks. You got to beat this team because when you go on the West Coast to play the Nuggets, Trailblazers, and the Lakers, I don't know if you're going to win any of those games, to be honest. I mean, the Lakers don't have LeBron, so you might be able to squeak that one. But the Nuggets look like the best team in the league right now. I, I kind of would say that they are the best team in the league. And the Trailblazers, they're always a tough play. They're always a tough play. So this game is absolutely crucial for the Celtics. So moving on to the Boston Red Sox now. We've talked about the Boston Bruins having a massive win. We've talked about the Celtics having a massive win. Now let's talk about the Boston Red Sox and their massive win. So after getting swept by the Orioles on opening day weekend, the Red Sox swept the Tampa Bay Rays at Fenway, uh, which was, you know, we went, Kim and I went to that first game. So we kind of set the tone. We were their good luck charm in order to, you know, sweep the Rays, which was nice. But on the side note is the Red Sox also won the first game against the Orioles uh, yesterday on Thursday in Candom Yards in Baltimore. So Red Sox are currently on a four-game winning streak, which is very nice to see. They are currently tied for first place in the American League East with the Baltimore Orioles, which just makes this series very much more important. Um, big series early in the se uh, season as it sets the tone moving forward, and that tone I'm referring to is being able to beat the team you're supposed to beat. Just like both the Bruins and the Celtics, the Red Sox need to do the same exact thing. You should be able to beat the Tampa Bay Rays. You should be able to beat the Baltimore Orioles. Yankees and Blue Jays, once those games come around, going to be a different story. But losing all three games to the Baltimore Orioles to start the season really puts you, oh, really puts you um, behind the eight ball. But being able to sweep the Rays and then the first game against the Orioles winning, massive, massive swing. Hopefully this momentum can take them and push them forward as we obviously continue this series and then we look ahead to the rest of the calendar which let me pull up really quickly uh, oh after the series they'll be off to minnesota and then back home for the uh, white Sox, blue jays mariners and then i'm not going to go any further than that because baseball plays a lot more games in the same amount of times that hockey and basketball both play less amount of games so i don't want to get too ahead of myself big series against the orioles this weekend obviously they got the game uh, tomorrow, and then they got the game on Sunday against the Orioles, all in Candom Yards, like I mentioned. But something that I really want to talk about that the Red Sox did that really left a sour taste in my mouth, and I'm sure it left a sour taste in all of you Sox fans, is on Tuesday, I'm sorry, not on Tuesday, on Thursday, 
the Red Sox activated Eduardo Rodriguez from the 10-day IL. That's not the sour taste that I'm talking about. That's an exciting, exhilarating, a happy feeling because he was a really good pitcher, almost great pitcher in 2019. Then comes 2020, he gets COVID, and then he has the heart condition. No idea if he was ever going to play baseball again. Come to find out, he fully recovered, and he will. So props to Eduardo Rodriguez before I say anything else. Excellent job taking care of your body first and foremost, and then coming back to rehab and become a major league pitcher again. Absolutely triumphant job. Couldn't be happier to have him back in the rotation because honestly, until Chris Sale comes back, he is the ace. He is going to hold it down, and we need him in that rotation because that rotation is still not good. But the sour taste in my mouth that I am referring to is the fact that the Red Sox optioned Tanner Houck to Worcester. They optioned him to the alternate site. I have no freaking idea why they did this. Absolutely bad move by the Red Sox as Houck is your best up-and-coming starter. Not just your starter, but your best up-and-coming pitcher, period, in your farm system. At your alternate site, in your bullpen, whatever you want to call it. He is your best up-and-coming pitcher. And he needs to be developed by getting Major League Baseball pitching reps. He's going to get nothing out of throwing to the same guys over and over again down at Worcester on the alternate site with the other, I don't know, however many there are, 20 of them. I couldn't even tell you how many people are down in Worcester. But he's not going to improve anything. He might, you know, pick up a couple things, maybe just, you know, throw bullpens and look good down there. But he's not getting real baseball experience, and he needs that. I understand he's young, and your hands may be tied with the rotation, but he had a great start against the Baltimore Orioles, and he would have won that second game of the season for the Sox or his first start, like I mentioned, if the Red Sox played better defense and got him some runs. Just picture that. If... The Red Sox played better defense behind him, and they actually got maybe two runs, three runs. He would have won. He would have won that start. And then plus, he struck out another two in relief on top of the eight guys that he struck out just a few days prior. So, so far in his six, seven innings that he's pitched, he struck out 10 guys. He's 24 years old. When do the Sox expect him to arrive, quote unquote, arrive? To the big league if he's still quote not ready i mean he's 24 years old it's not like he's 20 or 21 if he was 21 years old fine i would totally understand it completely young guy might have had some luck go down there you know really hone in your skills and we'll see you back up later on but he's 24 years old we need to see what we have in him because if he is not the real deal then he's just going to be another Henry Owens where it's a prospect who is your best pitching prospect, has a bunch of hype, and then ultimately sucks. How long are we going to wait till we figure that out? Because we hold, held on for as long as possible with Henry Owens. I don't think we should do that with Tanner Houck. I think we need to get him as much pitching reps as possible. He doesn't need um, more reps down in Worcester. He needs to get actual Major League starts. If, I mean, if anything, you should have option to relief pitcher from your bullpen who has like your pitching rotations, like 14 guys, 15 guys down there. Not, you don't need all of those relievers. And I understand that you have the flexibility to carry more pitchers because you have Marwin Gonzalez, you have Kike Hernandez who can play all over the field in diamond. I get that. That you basically have two Brock Holtz on your team who are better. So that kind of alleviates the need for a a fourth position player on your bench. You got your backup catcher in Ploiecki. You have Marwin Gonzalez, who's a utility man. And then you have uh, Franchi Cordero, basically your fourth outfielder, depending on, you know, who's out there. You could sit. uh, You could sit. I mean, you're carrying Christian Arroyo, who's just a backup infielder, because you have so much depth and he kind of helps... With the infield, if you don't, if you want to have Marwin at first base and Kike in the outfield, whatever, 
you're able to do that because you have two super utility guys in Marwin Gonzalez and Kike Hernandez, which probably robbed Michael Chavis of a uh, opening day roster spot because Christian Royal has no more options left. Who gives a flying bag of sand about it? And I mean, who has the brighter future, Arroyo or Chavis? I'm going to go Chavis, and I'm sure you would too. So with those utility guys, it gives you the flexibility to carry one less player on your bench and to have an extra pitcher or two out in that bullpen. Plus, you have 26 guys in your roster now, not just 25. So there's an extra roster spot as well for a pitcher. Are we really going to carry 14 pitchers the entire season? I wouldn't put it past the Red Sox, but like seriously? And if you're going to carry the 14 pitchers, then why don't you carry your 14 best pitchers? And we're not going to sit there and tell me that Tanner Houck isn't one of those 14 best pitchers. You easily could have optioned a relief pitcher down there and at least had Tanner Houck on the roster go with six starters or put him in the bullpen or move Garrett Richard to the bullpen because he clearly sucks. He had a terrible spring training and they the Sox still think that he can pitch. I think he needs to go to the bullpen to kind of figure things out. Obviously, you can't option him down to Worcester, but throw him in the bullpen, let him figure it out, be an emergency starter kind of guy until you actually need a starter full-time to replace a potential injury spot, right? I mean, I know in during spring, the Red Sox and Cora said that Tanner Houck will be a starting pitcher, whether it is with the Red Sox or in the minors. Absolutely could not agree more with that because you need starting pitchers. You need young pitching talent. Tanner Houck is that. You have Eduardo Rodriguez, who is who he is. You have Nathan Eovaldi, who is very good at what he does, but he's also getting up there in age. Chris Sale, coming off Tommy John surgery, starting to get up there in age. Martin Perez, as much as you know, Boston loves Perez and Perez Day, is he really a long-term solution in your rotation? I'm going to say no. And then you got Nick Pavetta who looked really good that game that Kim and I attended to on Monday. He looked really sharp and really good. I would like to see more of him as well, and we will. And that's just another example of bolstering. He is the example of getting your young guys to start. And Tanner Houck should be in that conversation with Pavetta as well, you know, influencing and pushing your young guys to start. And if they struggle, you make adjustments as necessary. But are we really going to sit there and say that Tanner Houck struggled against the Orioles that day when Raphael Devers and Xander Bogarts both got errors, which scored runs? And then on top of that, the Red Sox don't even score a single damn run that day. Are we really going to sit there and say that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Red Sox scored two runs, but that was after Houck exited the game. I'm just going to sit here and say no. Absolutely not. This is a terrible move by the Red Sox, and Red Sox fans should be upset about this. It just makes no sense. You have um, nine guys in that bullpen. Option one of them instead, because who has a brighter future, or who is more important to this team? Tanner Houck, or one of those nine pitchers? Now, obviously, Adam Ottavino, Matt Barnes, they're probably going to stay in the bullpen, obviously, but like, you could have picked anybody else. You could have. So I'm very disappointed in the Red Sox with this move. It's just the same, I feel the same exact way, actually even worse. I feel more heated about this than I did with Michael Chavis. I just hope to see both of those guys back on the big league roster relatively soon because the Red Sox need to develop pitching prospects. He's 24 years old, Tanner Houck is. I think he's ready to go and be thrown into the fire. And if he struggles, then you adjust accordingly. But this is a bad move because you're going to rely on Eduardo Rodriguez and Nathan Eobaldi. Fine. But then you're going to rely on Martin Perez, um, Garrett Richards, uh, who really sucks and struggled. And then obviously you have Nick Paveda, who's kind of you know unproven yet, still kind of in that boat that Tanner Houck is, but just a little bit more experienced. This is a true head scratcher from the Red Sox. I thank you so much for listening to that big rant. Let me move on to the Patriots before I dive back into and just completely bitch and complain more about the Red Sox and this a pitiful move. So 
switching over to the Red Sox before we um, switching over. See what I do it over and over and over again. Switching over to the Patriots, we have one terrible news and one kind of good news. I'll go over the terrible news first. Julian Edelman's knee is reported to most likely restrict him from playing the whole season in 2021. That's absolutely awful news. Before I go into anything, let's just say Julian Edelman has been through a lot. With the knee injury, tearing it in a preseason game, uh, losing you know his good friends Amendola, Hogan, and obviously his best friend Brady. The, the dude's an animal. He has given his whole heart and soul to this Patriots team. Being a seventh-round draft pick, uh, being drafted as a quarterback, but being told you're going to play wide receiver, and then you know being a return specialist, making a name for yourself there, and then becoming an absolute stud wide receiver for a team, being a part of three Super Bowl championships, winning MVP in one of them. This is terrible news because, obviously, Edelman had a... Um, Played a couple games last year, then he got injured, and we were really looking forward to him to bounce back because you you know, bringing the gang back together plus some right you bring in in uh, you bring in Edelman back you bring uh, Cam Newton back you bring in James White back David Andrews being on center, then you got Hunter Henry John O Smith Nelson Aguilar Kendrick Bourne, it's like damn, we can do it, and then Edelman's gonna be kind of that you know. That you know, veteran with all the experience to kind of help guide the younger players on the team. You know, especially bringing in uh, Kendrick Bourne and Nelson Aguilar. So, I, I just, does Edelman just does he just retire at this point? Does he just call it a career and just you know ride off into the sunset? I mean, this story. Is starting to shape up and look like what we saw and experienced with Dustin Pedroia. Dustin Pedroia injures his knee. Then he rehabs and he comes back and then it's re-injured again. And he's out for the season. And then the Red Sox said that, oh, he'll be healthy for the season. Then he comes back and he can not he can only play a couple games. And then he's out. And then he retires. A lot of hope and optimism was with Dustin Pedroia and the Red Sox from the, from the reports that we were told. And then he ultimately retires. I mean, absolutely incredible career, deserves all the high praise, Pedroia, and then absolutely off into the sunset he goes, wish he could have finished his career on a higher note. Honestly, starting to see that with Julian Edelman. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here. You, know, you can tell by the tone of my voice that you know this is something serious because you know knee injuries are no joke. No j- injuries are a joke, especially in football. But... You can only rehab and train and go through the physical therapy, try to work your way back so many times, and then just get re-injured again. You can only do that so many times. You have to think about your quality of life moving forward. I mean, he has a daughter. She's very young. You got to think what's best for her. I would just hate to see him go out there and then just get re-injured again. And obviously, you can't, you know, protect you you can't say that you're not going to get injured you can only protect yourself and hope that you don't get injured because on any given play a a play could go sideways and then next thing you know you're getting carted off the field it's happened to ample players in nfl's history i mean you can only do so many transfusions surgeries rehabs trainings until you just kind of lose hope now, I think Edelman's going to try and come back, as I would expect him to. He's going to be 35 come the start of the season, as his birthday is next month. I mean, this is a really difficult spot for him to be in because of everything he's already gone through in his career. But like I said, I don't expect him to just call it quits now. I truly expect him to give it one more shot, especially the way the season ended last year, not only for him, but just for the Patriots in general. But I think this is his last go at it. And we could honestly see him retire, not just because of injuries, but just retire from the league because he's going to be 35 relatively soon. 
maybe at the end of this year. Maybe at the end of this year. And that really sucks and it's really sad to say, but we have to look at it. It's reality. That's just reality. But really quickly, I kind of want to switch to some like kind of good news is uh, did anybody remember that that seventh round draft pick last year that the Patriots had, uh, he was a center and the Patriots drafted him, like I said, in the seventh round. And then he unexpectedly retired in August, right before the season started. Well, his name is Dustin Woodard and he's coming out of retirement and he is on the active roster. The Patriots activated him. So he's back with the club. Uh, yay. I mean, <laughs> This is kind of a confusing one, but I, I mean, I was I was pissed that he retired, not because like you know he was good and we were losing out on talent. It's just a team invested a draft pick into you. You were one of two hundred and fifty whatever draft picks, and then you just retire out of thin air with really no no reason. Like I mean, if it was due to COVID then you could have went on the COVID exempt list. If it was because of a injury, then you don't say it's because of an injury. I mean, no one's going to make fun of you for that. But just to retire out of thin air, and then he's like, oh, I'm back. I'm kind of assuming that it was because of COVID. Maybe he just didn't know that he could go on the COVID exempt list. I I, I don't know, but I don't know. I mean, yay that he's back. I mean, the Patriots have another uh, lineman to kind of work out and deal with. He's going to be behind David Andrews, who just came back. Ted Karras, who just came back. So we're just going to have to see what he's going to do. I mean, he'll be a nice little addition. I have no idea how good he is or what he brings to the table. So, yeah. <laughs> Yay, Dustin Woodard's back. But, guys, at the end of the day, we talked about so much stuff. Like I said, Bruins, massive win. Celtics, massive win. Red Sox are hot right now, even though they just made a dumbass transaction move with one of their best up and coming pitchers and then obviously a little bit of Patriots news I say this I say this I say this and I'm going to I promise we are going to dive deep into the draft because the draft is coming up fast I want to do a first round mock draft I want to do a Patriots uh, full round or full draft mock draft and I really kind of want to dive deep into what the Patriots could be doing at 15 because like I said um, in the beginning I thought they were going to go for a quarterback I thought they were going to go for offensive weapon, but it seems like in a lot of signs point that they might go defense in the first round, which I kind of alluded to a few episodes ago, uh, like last week or so. I, you know, I could see them completely going with defense at this point uh, with their roster. But, I mean, with all the trades going on in the NFL, we can't rule out anything. I mean, there's even mock drafts and ru- rumors that the Patriots are going to try to trade up to number four to draft Justin Fields or one of the two quarterbacks that would be remaining. After the first two, after the first three picks, will more likely be quarterbacks. So a lot of Patriots stuff is coming up. I know that Patriots content has been kind of dry lately, obviously because it's the off season and hockey, basketball are completely in the full heat of their season. Red Sox and baseball just started, so a lot is going on in a bunch of sports. So much to talk about. You definitely not going to want to miss any episodes of Murph's Boston Sports Talk because I'm going to be covering everything that involves one of your four major sports teams here in Boston. If you just like the Celtics, I will be covering it. If you just like the Red Sox and the Bruins, I will be covering it. If you love all four teams, I will be covering it. You're not going to want to miss a single episode here on Murph's Boston Sports Talk. But guys, ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls all over the world, if you're a banana, you're a banana. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, and enjoying Please, please, please tell somebody about the podcast. It would be greatly appreciated. And please don't forget to use those Amazon affiliate links if you would be so kind to do so. I'm going to catch you in the next one. But before I go, please reach out to me on Twitter and Instagram at Murphs underscore Boston ST, where the ST stands for Sports Talk. And if you're watching on YouTube, if you haven't already and enjoyed this video, please leave a like rating and subscribe to the channel if you're new or you haven't subscribed already. Thank you so much for joining me, and as always, as always, I will catch you in the next one, but until then, enjoy your weekend, and see you on Monday. Love y'all. See ya.